Welcome back to Face the Nation. Wagner Group leader Yevgeny Prigozhin is actually wanted by the FBI here in the U.S. for his efforts to meddle in the 2016 elections. CBS News foreign correspondent Deborah Pata has been tracking the Wagner Group, and she reports this morning from Johannesburg, South Africa. Yevgeny Prigozhin's uprising appears to have been extremely well planned and executed. Who would have thought? One of Putin's closest allies, a former convict turned Kremlin caterer, would eventually be pitted against the Russian leader. It was during Russia's first invasion of Ukraine in 2014 that Prigozhin made the leap from Putin chef to warlord, running an off-the-books mercenary group. Wagner soldiers started showing up in Syria, then across Africa. And while his hired guns deal in death, Prigozhin makes his money by plundering natural resources in places like the mineral-rich Central African Republic, or CAR. In exchange, Wagner provides the mercenary muscle to prop up the country's leader, even guarding the president. What Wagner doesn't say is that they effectively run this nation through violence and a galaxy of shell companies. Now, this model is repeated across Africa, allowing Prigozhin to evade sanctions and rake in billions to fund what the U.S. has called a transnational criminal organization, as well as his private army in Ukraine. Until recently, Prigozhin vigorously denied any links to Wagner, but stepped out of the shadows last year, recruiting prisoners from Russian penal colonies in exchange for pardon and at salaries far higher than any regular Kremlin soldiers. And he certainly enjoyed the notoriety, filming himself strutting around the battlefield and delivering Putin his only real victory after months of war, capturing Solidar and Bakhmut at a heavy cost, though, as many of his mercenaries were killed in that fighting. Now, throughout this war, Prigozhin has appeared untouchable and has survived even after this armed insurrection. And he seems convinced, Margaret, that at the very least, he will continue his reign in Africa, the real Wagner money spinner. Deborah Pada, thank you. For more on the situation in Russia, we turn to CBS News national security correspondent David Martin and former U.S. ambassador to Russia, now a CBS News contributor, John Sullivan. Good to have both of you here. Um, David, uh, let's start on just what happened on the ground. 124 miles outside of Moscow. That's how far the Wagner Group says they got. What does this tell us about Russia's intelligence and military? Well, it came as a surprise to U.S. intelligence. They, they had some warning that there was going to be a mutiny. But they were surprised when the uh, Russians put up no resistance, allowed um, uh, Prigozhin to go into their military headquarters in Rostov, and then send his army unopposed north toward Moscow. Um, and then they were surprised again by how quickly a deal was made. They had expected uh, a longer, more violent affair. And that's why people like the National Security Advisor, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, canceled their travel plans because there was the danger that this mutiny could mushroom into a civil war. And that brings up all sorts of concerns about the security of Russia's nuclear weapons. And what you learn is that when a person like Putin is sitting on top of an arsenal of thousands of nuclear weapons, his problems very quickly become your problems. Right. And, and Ambassador, I mean, it's, it sounds strange sometimes, that phrase, catastrophic success, when foreign policy analysts talk about it. But are we actually in a situation where Vladimir Putin is preferable to Yevgeny Prigozhin in terms of running the Russian state? Well, he's certainly a known quantity. He's a, a hardened adversary of the United States, but the alternative could be worse. So I think the Biden administration is rightfully concerned, as, as David suggests, with chaos and uncertainty in Russia with their nuclear arsenal is very dangerous, not just for the United States, but for the world. So. When we, when you look at the map, uh, Rostov, the the city that you mentioned, it's a major logistics hub on that route to Moscow. 
Do we have any insight yet, David, into what's happening within the Russian military right now? Are they remaining loyal to Vladimir Putin? There was no sign that uh, any of the security apparatus around Putin had, uh, had switched sides. They seem to hang, hang tough with Putin. The, the question of uh, why there was no Russian resistance, I mean, one possible explanation is because uh, Putin told them mm -hmm. not to resist. We're going to settle this as quickly and as peacefully as possible. Um, Ambassador, it was a surprise to many when it was Belarus that announced that they were the brokers here, that the president of that country. Now, that country is pretty much viewed as a, a vassal state of Russia. Vladimir Putin controls it. There are nuclear weapons that Vladimir Putin says he's putting there. Explain this part of the puzzle. Like, wh why would Yevgeny Prigozhin move to Belarus? Why are they suddenly appearing to be power brokers? Well, as, as you point out, Margaret, Lukashenko is in power now as president because of Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin came to his rescue in August 2020. It was Lukashenko who was dependent on Putin. But now, think about this. This is, as you know, uh, Belarus is part of a union state with Russia. They are conjoined. How dependent now is Putin on Lukashenko? It's, an, it's, a, it's evidence of the weakness that this reveals, what's happened in the last uh, three or four days, the weakness of Vladimir Putin. It's not just an appearance of weakness, it's actual weakness. Mm -hmm. A person that he has said is a traitor who has stabbed him and his nation in the back he struck a deal with, a deal that he needed to strike to avoid bloodshed and chaos? What strong leader does that? Well, exactly. And, and when you look at, I think for so many Americans who are learning about Wagner Group for the first time, and they just heard Deborah's great reporting there, the U.S. considers them a transnational criminal organization. Is this like the mafia has its own military? I mean, how do we think about this? Well, Prigozhin himself spent most of the 1980s in prison because he's a career criminal. Wagner operates in states in Africa and elsewhere, not because they're patriots who are executing policy on behalf of the Russian government. They're there to get access to gold, mine, gold mines, oil resources, and so forth. This is a money-making organization, corrupt organization, that the United States correctly treats as a transnational criminal organization. And that's what, David, it was interesting to hear from both the secretary and Mike Turner this concern of what happens next, not just in Ukraine, but in Libya, in Syria, throughout Africa. Do we have any concept yet? Uh, I mean, does this become a separate company? Does this become part of the Russian military? Well, I somehow don't think that uh, Pogosian has gone to Belarus to live out his days in idle exile. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's uh, out of the game. And although there's been this deal with uh, Vladimir Putin, who says Vladimir Putin is going to deliver mm -hmm. on the deal? I mean, if I were Prigozhin, I would keep my bodyguards close and my food taster closer because poison is one of uh, uh, Putin's favorite instruments of uh, getting revenge. Mm -hmm. He has a force of, what, 25,000 under his command, allegedly? That's, that's what he's credited for. He was at uh, the start of this year, he was credited with 50,000. And I think the drop from 50 to 25,000 is uh, a measure of how much they lost in the, uh, in the fighting in, in eastern Ukraine. This was uh, great to have your analysis and your reporting. Thank you both. Thanks, Margaret. We'll be right back. It's now been one year since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, and the political dissension over abortion rights continues to grow. We've recently discussed the topic with Republican presidential candidates on this broadcast, but today we turn to Texas Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, a co-chair of President Biden's re-election bid, and she joins us from El Paso. Good morning to you, Congresswoman. Uh, it's been 50 years since 1973 and that ruling. Um, but in that time, Congress failed to pass any protections for abortion access. Um, even when Democrats controlled both houses, even when presidents were Democrats. 
We're now at this point where our CBS News polling shows 53 percent of Democrats feel as though your party isn't doing enough on the issue of abortion. Why do Democrats think this is a winning issue for the party when they've not been able to deliver on it for so long? Well, Margaret, um, the, the House Democrats have passed the Women's Health Care Protection Act. We did that uh, both sessions of Congress, the last two, when we had a majority. But as you know, and as the American people know, we did not have a wide enough majority in the Senate. In the Senate, because of the filibuster, mm -hmm. uh, the Senate has not acted on protecting access and women's freedom to have access to abortion care. But it is really important that we look at what's happened since uh, Roe v. Wade was overturned by uh, the Republican-controlled Supreme Court. We have seen 23 million women lose access to reproductive health care. We've seen 18 states enact harsh abortion bans. And we have also seen every single Republican nominee express support for a federal national abortion ban. We cannot go in that direction, and that's why these upcoming elections are critically important. But even when there was unified control, it wasn't delivered on. Um, when you look at what's happening now, half of those polled by CBS say abortion access has become more restricted over the past year, as you just detailed. So we know President Biden's taking these executive actions and orders. Why isn't there more grassroots mobilization at the state level if the entire point of the court ruling was that it goes back to the states? We have seen grassroots uh, mobilization at the state level. We've seen states- You're saying you're losing the argument though. I'm sorry? But you just detailed that state by state in many places, you're losing that argument. Well, states are making every effort and grassroots organizations and women across the country are working to put in protections at the state constitutional level. But the challenge that we will face should Republicans uh, maintain control of the House and gain control of the Senate or the White House is that we would see national restrictions that are harsher and more serious than, than what we see today. So we've got a very, um, we've got a, a huge challenge on our hands in the sense that women's reproductive freedoms continue to be rolled back. And the only way to win that is by winning elections, uh, both make, making sure that we flip the House and regain control mm -hmm. and that we elect a wide enough margin, a filibuster proof majority or senators willing to lift the majority to protect women. And we've got to maintain the White House. Well, Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley was recently on this program, and she said candidates aren't telling the American people the truth, Republicans and Democrats, she puts in that bucket. She said there's, you know, there's neither the consensus nor the votes for either party to either legalize or fully ban abortion. Listen to what she said. So let's be honest with the American people and say, let's find national consensus. Let's agree on you know, getting rid of late term abortions. Let's agree on the fact that we need more adoptions. Let's agree on the fact that we need accessible contraception. Let's agree on the fact that mothers shouldn't be jailed or go to, you know, get the death penalty for abortions. Doesn't she have a point? There are smaller issues related to abortion you can find consensus on? The national consensus, Margaret, is that 80% of Americans do not agree with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. But in terms that of what is, you could actually get passed in Congress. Well, we, again, we, Democrats passed the Women's Health Care Protection Act in, in the, the House. House. Yes, we only in the majority. House. And the challenge in the Senate is that you need a supermajority. You right. need 60 votes. Exactly. Um, and so... Right, which is why we need to win elections this uh, uh, next November. And furthermore, we've got to retain the White House because there's only one person who will be on the ballot next November, and that's President Biden, who has promised and committed to fighting for women's reproductive freedom. The, the, make no mistake about it. Yeah. The, as much as Nikki Haley wants to talk about finding consensus here and there, the bottom line well, is- stopping all women from being prosecuted, for example, the death penalty. I mean, you have to appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, why not pass a law on that front? Can, can you imagine- Is that not that's, worth it? That's their. That's where they want to allow. Well, she's consensus. saying, let's pass a law to prevent that on the national level. 
Well, I, I, my perspective, and I think the vast majority of Americans' perspective, is we want the protections under Roe v. Wade restored. 80%, and in fact, even So 24 weeks. I'm sorry? Uh, protection up to 24 weeks of pregnancy. That's your defined position. I know that's what was in the, the Protection Act, but specifically that's what you are endorsing. Roe v. Wade essentially protects a woman's right to access abortion. And what we are seeing in states like my own in Texas, where the rollbacks have happened and, and the bans are occurring, okay. is that even in, in cases where women's health is yes. at risk, uh, politicians don't really care okay. about the, the health of the woman. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for coming on and making that case. We'll be back in a moment. We turn now to the global hunger crisis and our conversation with the new executive director of the United Nations World Food Program, Cindy McCain. She spoke to us Thursday from New York, where she addressed the UN Security Council about what she called a spiraling hunger crisis in parts of the world. There are a lot of fires in the world right now. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of countries that are in deep distress, Somalia being one of them. And so we're spread pretty thin right now. And so to be able to continue the work that we do, obviously we, meet, we need more help, but we need the world to pay attention to us also and make sure that people understand it's not just a security crisis in Somalia, it's a humanitarian crisis as well. I know you recently lost some employees in Sudan, where the United States has pulled out because of uh, the violence there. Are you still able to feed people despite the war? Well, we never left Sudan. We, we stalled for a little bit. We paused for a few days because you're correct, we did lose three people there. Uh, and we had to evacuate our other uh, citizens, our other nationals, as well as our international people out. Uh, but we never left. And so we are now, again, we're back in, we're distributing food. Uh, again, reminding everyone it's extraordinarily dangerous there right now. So our methods and how we're doing it, we're, it, it are a little bit different. But we also have asked the UN to please guarantee us a, a humanitarian corridor for us to be able to work and operate so we can deliver our food. I know the U.S. is the largest financial donor to the World Food Program and the U.N., having given $7.2 billion, more than all other donors combined last year. Meanwhile, the world's second largest economy, China, gave $11 million. How receptive is Beijing to your requests? Well, I'd like to encourage Beijing to get involved and be a part of this. We need, not only do we need their funding, but we need their expertise on many things. Their, their technology with regards to agriculture and the technology with regards to, to climate change can be very helpful in these countries that are really struggling with drought and lack of food, et cetera. Is the issue that the government wants credit, and so therefore they want to do it under their own flag? and not through the international system, which you represent? I think to some degree you're correct on that. I think it's also just a willingness to be a part of, of working together as a team worldwide. Uh, in these countries that we're in, one agency cannot do, cannot do the job. We need partnerships. And so we encourage the Chinese and we encourage many, encourage many other countries around the world to partner with us. You know, in the room, when you are trying to pitch the Security Council, you are looking at the United States, you are talking to China, you're also talking to Russia, um, mm -hmm. in addition to some other members. But I, I want to pick up specifically on the Kremlin because they said, this past week, there were no grounds to extend the Black Sea Grain Initiative. That is the deal under which Russia agreed to allow grain to leave the ports of Ukraine, a country it is militarily occupying. That's arguably weaponizing food. What's the impact uh, if that deal goes away? Well, the impact is, again, we're short on grain. And what does that mean? It affects but a, lot, a large portion of Africa. We're also short on fertilizer. Fertilizer is the other half of this that's, com that's supposed to be coming out. And so without the fertilizer, in many cases, they're not going to be able to grow crops that are, that are as large or as productive as they could be. For all the things that, that are going on, I truly wish that we could end this war so that we could begin again to feed 
people around the world and, and so that the Ukrainians can also feed themselves. What's at stake here is starvation and famine. That's what we're looking at. There's been an uptick in migrants to the United States from Haiti, which is now largely uh, controlled by gangs. How do you keep the food you are getting into that island nation out of the hands of criminals and into the mouths of starving children? Well, you're exactly right. Uh, the importance is, is that the international community needs to be in there uh, to not only help keep the country safe, but to, but to help us be, enable our organization, other organizations, to be able to move the grains around and move food around in general. Uh, the idea in, in Haiti, which is such a lush tropical island, island, but it is also affected by climate change, it's also affected by, by, you know, by land use. I think the world community has taken a step forward Forward and kind of forgotten Haiti a little bit. So, so my job, having returned from Haiti, is to remind the world that Haiti is still there, it still needs our help, it still needs food, it still needs security, and it needs to be able to, to prosper in a way so that the, they don't lose a generation of children. Broadly speaking, extreme weather um, is a factor that's affecting crops and migration. Uh, you've said climate change is influencing the situations in a number of the examples you just gave. Where are you seeing it impact the most? Well, one of the places is the Sahel. Uh, I mean, the, the, if you could see what's down there and see the, the impact that the, the, the climate change has had on it. Uh, so what we're what we are doing with regards to the Sahel and other regions, particularly in Africa, is water management, uh, teaching ancient ways which are very simple to do. And climate change, not just in Africa or the Sahel, the climate change is worldwide. And we're going to be seeing, uh, you know, we're having to manage crops now that, are, that have to be more resilient to drought. Uh, our animal feed and things have to be more resilient so the animals can be more resistant to drought. There's a lot of things at stake here. And I think when people talk about climate change uh, and, and those naysayers that think climate change isn't real, I'd like to take them to the Sahel and show them what's real. Cindy McCain at the United Nations, thank you. Thank you.